Welcome to my study. After 30 years, I've concluded that everything you need to know to be successful in every part of your life is found in one book, the Bible. Every time we get together, we talk about important subjects. And the last time we're together, we talked about how to recover from the destruction that comes from anger, 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 anger. And we learned some things about it. We learned, first of all, that anger is a major destroyer of relationships. Ever tried to be friends with an angry person? Oh, not what it works so good. We also learned that recovery is really difficult. Scripture says that if you help somebody get over it, you got to help them again and again. It's not easy to recover, but it's necessary. And then we learned that anger is contagious. <laughs> you could get it from your parents. That's true. But the scripture says, make no friendship with an angry man. Uh, and with a furious man, thou shalt not go at all, lest thou learn his ways and get a snare to your soul. So it's contagious. It rubs off. So be careful. Don't make friends with angry people. And then we learn that anger is accumulative. In other words, it builds up. It's cumulative. It builds up. Um, let me show you a little bit of a diagram. Here's a person blurred out of uh, uh, <clears throat> recognition. <laughs> So let's say that somebody does something or says something to him and he gets mad. According to the scripture, uh, he, this anger rests inside of him. And then the next time somebody else ticks him off again, gets some more anger in here and then some more anger. And this thing builds up. Anger rests, the scripture says, in the bosom of a fool. What is a fool? Someone who doesn't take remedial steps, which he's able to do to correct something. So what's happened? So let's say this guy has this buildup of anger now, and then somebody comes along and really aggravates him here. And what often happens is this built up anger, oh, it just explodes here in big dimensions, bigger. In fact, the anger reaction is usually greater than the provocation. Why is that? Because this built up accumulate anger, it's, it's, just, it just, it's like the spark that sets off the whole powder keg. And so somebody can be angry like this and then and it gets so mad that, uh, in fact, when we understand that uh, anger is involved in most crimes, most criminal activities. So we learn that anger is accumulative. It rests in the bosom of a fool. I don't want to walk away from that for just a moment because uh, in case you're interested, we have a teaching, 28 minutes long. No, I think it's two 28-minute teachings on how to wisely deal with fools. Dealing with a fool is different than dealing with the average person, although it seems like the average person is pretty foolish these days. How to wisely deal with fools. Important instruction from the scripture on, because uh, you're probably going to meet a lot of fools. We don't get to call them fools. You'll learn that, among other things, about how to wisely deal with fools. And then another teaching that we have is to learn how does a fool think? Uh, we know he thinks foolishly, but what, what are the ingredients of that? And that comes from Psalm number 14 and gives us all the details. So anger is cumulative. It rests in the bosom of a fool. We also learn that anger causes trouble always. I mean, strife, contention. I mean, major wars are born out of anger. We also learn that anger can only be conquered by the control of one's own spirit. For he that controls himself is mightier than the man that can conquer an entire city. In fact, one scripture says that uh, he that controls not his spirit is like a city with the walls broken down. Anybody can come in and ravage, ransack the place. We learn that anger is motivated by iniquity, and that always produces failure. This is this has to do with this has to do with narcissism. Iniquity is the Bible word for narcissism, and what happens? is when a person is driven by their narcissism, anybody or anything that gets in the way of their self-fulfillment, their ego, ah, mm, they get angry about it, and it always produces failure. In fact, uh, we learned, didn't we, that discipline out of anger will not correct a person. So we put this diagram together, take a look. The Bible says the rod of his anger shall fail when a parent goes to correct a child with anger, the child doesn't get the correction. He only gets the anger. The anger is the mechanism that overshadows 
the intent to adjust, correct, and and help uh, a child or any other person be better. Then we learned that anger produces health problems. And we gave you a whole list of those. And those health problems relate not just to the one who's angry, but to those who are afflicted, affected rather. <laughs> afflicted would also be a good word, by the anger. And then we learned that anger must absolutely be resolved. There has to be a solution. There are a lot of courses that you can take or have been offered, at least on anger control, but what we're not looking for control, we're looking for resolution. How to resolve anger. And so this is the subject of our day. Recovering from the destruction of anger, how do we do it? How shall we get rid of our own anger? Uh, we've already learned how to deal with the anger that other people have towards us. Remember the three steps? They remember were, were, first of all, you regulate them if you can. If you can't, then you have to insulate from them. If you can't insulate, then you need to isolate from them. Those are the three degrees of getting other people angry out of, your, out of the place of influence in your life. So our subject today, though, is, is, is how, what if, how do we get rid of our own anger? That's the question for the day. So grab your paper, pencil, take some notes. I hope this will help you. Here it is, step number one. Accept personal responsibility for anger. Look at the scripture now. Um, in fact, the scripture says that uh, in times, you used to be like this. You used to live a certain way. Now watch this. But now you have put off these things. We're going to go through that list in a moment. So in other words, there must be the acceptance of personal responsibility for anger. we got to do something about it. It's not something else somebody else can do. It's a personal responsibility for our own anger. Now, before we get started, there's one fundamental truth that we must know. And it is simply this, that God only commands us to do what we are able to do. Did you get that? God gives you an instruction, and he, all of his instructions are, are doable. They are doable. Now, there's a doctrine, widespread, many denominations, all kinds of, and, and within Christianity, it's called the doctrine of moral inability. God tells me to do something, but I can't do it. And so, uh, for example, here are the Ten Commandments listed for us. I shall not kill. I can't help myself. I have to kill. I can't help myself. I have to steal. Uh, and so we have learned to excuse ourselves with all kinds of, well, false doctrine. Now, let me tell you how bad this doctrine is gets. Because there are those who say, well, I know God told me to do that, but I'm unable to do that. And I want to question, this is not a matter of can or can't, it's a matter of will or won't. It is not can or can't, it's will or won't. For example, <clears throat> if God tells you to do something and you don't do it, and then God punishes you, can you imagine? Can you imagine the injury this does for the character of God, for those who say, well, God told me to do it, I can't do it, and I'm going to get punished for it. Can you imagine God punishing people for doing something they can't stop doing? Well, it's unthinkable. Just and holy, righteous God, he is. That, would, that just doesn't fit, you see. So this idea that God will punish people for doing what they can't help do, or not doing what they can't help not doing is a false doctrine of such severe nature um, that many are trapped with this idea. I can't. I can't. I'm suggesting that it's not a matter of can or can't, it's will or won't. And if a person can't do it, there's only one reason why. The narcissist has got an agenda. And he can't do what God wants him to do because it would interfere with his agenda. Ha! Huh. 
And this points out, my friends, the difference between genuine followers of Jesus and those who are fake. Ah. It's everywhere. Now, <clears throat> we've got to get this straight. We can do what God tells us to do. We can. We can. We absolutely can. There's no such thing as can't. In fact, if you lack strength, he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Have to replace this whole idea of I can't with I can. If God gives us an instruction to do something, we can do it. Now, if in some weakened will or some condition we struggle with it, <clears throat> well, we have only to ask of God who will help us out. That's why this great scripture, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. If I need more strength, I got it. But the idea is that we can. Remember this, that God only commands what we are able to do. And the reason I'm starting here is because what we're going to do right now is talk about God's instruction, which begins to, to help us recover from anger, right? And it begins with accepting personal responsibility for anger, which we are, in fact, able to do. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> just before I leave the subject, I, I want to I recommend that you visit our website, which is nothingbutthetruth.org, nothingbutthetruth.org. And there's a series there called The Joy of Living by Commandment. Ooh. And what is that? <laughs> and it's simple. Before I decide, speak, or act in any given situation, I first check to see if God has a command that applies. And if so, I obey that command immediately, joyfully, and without compromise. That's what it means to live by commandments. Jesus asked the question, why? Why do, you say, why do you call me Lord, but you don't do what I say? You don't obey. Scripture says that the Spirit of God is given to them that obey. We live by commandment, and it's easy. We just say, yes, sir, once we know the commandment, and we do it. I want you to learn this. So let me put it up on the screen for you. Living by commandment means before I decide or speak or act in any given situation, I first check to see if God has a command that applies. Now watch this. And if so, I obey that commandment immediately, joyfully, and without compromise. Now, <clears throat> uh, I, I want you to know that you can get further instruction on this. The joy of living by commandment. There's several parts to it. Nothingbutthetruth.org is our website address, and you can buy free, free of charge there to learn this. In fact, let me tell you a little story. 17 years ago, a couple with their two little children attended our church for the first time, checking us out to see if they wanted to be part of our church. And it happened to be the Sunday when I taught what we're talking about right now, the joy of living by commandment. And I kept giving this definition before we decide to speak or act in any given situation. We first check to see if God is the command that applies. And if so, we obey that command immediately, joyfully, and without compromise. <laughs> so the service got over. The people, the family went their way. And uh, two days later, Tuesday, I think it was a Tuesday, the family is driving along. And mom and dad are in the front seat of the car having a discussion about what to do about some situation in their life. The little seven-year-old boy reaches in between the two front seats, taps his dad on the shoulder. And dad said, the answer to this is simple. And the little seven-year-old said this, Dad, before we decide, speak, or act in any given situation, <laughs> we first check to see if God has a command that applies. And if so, we obey that command immediately, joyfully, without compromise. <laughs> Guess what? That family joined the church. <laughs> and they've been there over 17 years now. Don't lose this definition. Look at it again on the screen. Before I decide, speak, or act, in any given situation, I first check to see if God is a command that applies, and if so, I obey that commandment immediately, joyfully, and without compromise. Oh my goodness, that is so good. 
because God, now remember, let's go back to this, God only commands what we are able to do. So now let's get back to our subject. And that subject is that we resolve anger, first point, by accepting the personal responsibility for anger. So here's a scripture. Here's a scripture that's going to tell you and me what to do about our anger. Ready? So here it goes. But now, now, now that you're this, living this changed life, put off. Put off all of these. Put, off, put them off. Put them off. Guess what? It's the first on the list. Anger. Personal responsibility. Just, oh, nope, not going to do, not going there, not doing that. You just put off anger. Then it says put off wrath, which is acts done in reaction. When you're angry, you do something back. Stop it. <laughs> Personal responsibility for anger means putting these things off. Stop. Put off the anger. Put off wrath. Put off malice. What is that? It's the intention or desire to do evil or to cause injury to another person. We, we just don't do that anymore because we are, look at this. This is what we used to be. We should be different, but now we put off these things. We put off anger. We put off wrath. We put off malice. Blasphemy. Whoa. Put it off. Stop. What is that? Take a look. It means to speak evil of sacred things, to be impious or irreverent. And uh, I need to stop there for a moment. Because that blasphemy is not just speaking evil of some sacred things, but all sacred things. Certainly, it includes God. Whoa, whoa. Don't speak evil of God ever. Big trouble there. But you see, every person is a sacred being. Here because God wanted them here. Embedded with natural abilities God placed in them when they were still in their mother's womb. Loved by God so much he gave his life for them. Every person you meet is a sacred person. So now if we're going to accept responsibility for our anger, we're going to put off anger and wrath and malice. And we're going to put off, look at this, put off speaking evil of other people. Zero, zero, zero. And then put off filthy communication out of your mouth. Just get it out of your mouth. And what is that? It means no more disgusting or offensively dirty, foul, or unclean language. Get rid of it. <clears throat> And then it goes on. This, this is the list. This is how you get rid of anger. You do what God says to do. And here's some more of what he says. In fact, it's true. We're going to get through the whole alphabet. <laughs> Don't lie. Lie not one to another. Why? Because look at you have put off what you used to be like. And now you put on this new man. Um. I need to stop there and talk for just a moment, if you don't mind. You know, Paul said in Romans chapter 7, I, I got this old man. There's an old man. There's a new man. There's me. I'm not as bad as the old man. I'm not as good as the new man. Maybe. I don't know. He said, what I want to do, I don't do. What I don't want to do, I do. And then he says this. Who shall deliver me from the court? body of this death, body of this death. Now that is an ancient concept. When a murderer was caught killing someone, the penalty was to take the dead body, the body of this death, tie that dead body on the back of the murderer, bound by ankle and wrist, and he had to carry the dead body until the dead body rotted, decayed, yeah, it became disease infested, spread into the murderer, and they died. He died along with them. And Paul said, I used to, I, 
who's going to deliver? I mean, it's like, I got this monkey on my back. I said, everywhere I go, this old man. Well, I want you to know, this is a personification. There's no old man, new man, and you. Uh, it's an old manner of life and a new manner of life. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And then he said, I thank God through our Lord Jesus Christ. For there's now no condemnation to them which are in Christ. You need to Romans 8 memorize it. So we are not to lie to one another. Why? Because we put off what we used to be like. We're not like that anymore. We're not liars anymore. Now, and watch this now. We've put off the old man, and look at this. We have put on the new man, which is renewed, like constantly being renewed. Renewed in what? And the knowledge, and knowledge, you really, you're getting more stuff in here all the time. Now this stuff though, look at this now, is after the image of him that created him. Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. So what we do is, ha, how do we conquer him? We got this new disposition, new way of looking, and we keep this renewed. Remember, you're transformed by the renewing of your mind, Romans 12. Right? But it's this renewal is after the image of him that created us. And then the scripture goes on with more instructions on how, if we're going to accept personal responsibility for anger, what we should do. Put on, therefore, put it on, put it up, put off, put on, put it on, therefore, as the elect of God. And I wish I had time to talk about that. Holy, and look at this, and beloved, bowels of mercy. Now, in these, King James Bible, the bowels of mercy, bowels back then did not refer to what we call bowels today. They are not part of the urinary uh, or this uh, uh, excretion system. Bowels meant your heart, your, your gut, your being, yourself. So how do we, if we're going to assume responsibility for anger, we got to be holy. Hmm. This is not a holier than thou thing. It's just be holy. Now, don't you love that about God that He's holy? And don't you love how God addresses you? He talks. He calls you beloved, and He wants you to have in your heart a merciful disposition. And this, if you will accept personal responsibility for anger, you will put on this new condition of your heart, and then. The next list, number 10, is kindness. Whoa. Whoa. Kindness. So somebody provokes us. Somebody gives us some cause that would normally react. We don't. Yeah. We have learned to return good for evil, haven't we? So kind of, we put on, and this is how you conquer anger. It takes humbleness of mind. Get rid of the ego. Get rid of the, the narcissism, humbleness of mind. Meekness was just kind of similar to that. The opposite to anger, actually. It is, it's, it's your strength under control. That's what meekness is. Your strength under control. Ah. Long-suffering. Don't we learn that in the thirteenth famous 13th chapter? Long-suffering. Love suffers long and is kind back to the one who's the cause of the suffering. <laughs> this is how you conquer anger. <clears throat> and then we forbear one another. What does that mean? Put up with. <laughs> Tolerate. Just suck it up. <laughs> Just accept it. Forbearing one another. And then forgiving one another. Forgiving. Forgiving. This is really a big deal. If any man has got a quarrel against it, just forgive him. Just, just forgive him. Just forgive him. We're going to come back to that one. And how should we do? We should forgive just like Christ forgave us. In fact, one of the great secrets of relationships is to treat others exactly the same way God treats us. Treating others the way Jesus treats you. Whoa, what a joy it is. Now, 
we're getting close to the end of the alphabet, but let's go now with number 17, Q. Here it is. Above all these things, and all of them are important, but above all of these, put on charity. Charity. Charity, the other Bible word for love. Ugh. Charity, which the Bible describes as the bond of perfectness. You cannot do better than love. So, to conquer the destruction of anger in our own lives, we accept personal responsibility, and one of those instructions is to love. Just love. Who do we love? We love those who don't love us. We return good for evil. If bless those that curse you, do good to those that do evil to you. You've heard it said you should love your friends and hate your enemies. No, I'm saying love your enemies. Do you see how anger is so summarily dismissed by all of these? And the fact, especially this, this is perfect. Love is perfect. Love thinks differently than hatred. Love thinks differently than evil. Love thinks differently than anger. <laughs> and then let the peace of God rule, act as the umpire, one scripture says, in your hearts. Let the peace, peace of God. Yeah. Let me tell you something. Angry people have no peace because they're all stirred up. They're all anxious. They're all ah, retaliating. Ah, oh, it was done to me. Oh, poor me. <laughs> Not us. Because we have a peace that the scriptures describe as a peace that passes understanding. People cannot figure it out. That's why Jesus came along and he said, my peace I give unto you, not like the world gives you. I'm not giving you peace like the world. See, the world peace requires all your ducks lined up in a row. Everybody doing the right thing. Ah. The world kind of peace requires your environment to be peaceful, not the peace of God. Doesn't matter what the environment is, no matter how tough it is, we live in peace and composure all the time. Then the scripture says, and be thankful. <clears throat> That's coming up. It's amazing to me the benefits of being a grateful person. They are stunning beyond the time that we've got today. Here's another way about being responsible for anger and having the power to do so. Let the word of God, Christ dwell stay in you richly look at this in all wisdom in wisdom wisdom is a really big deal wisdom is a really big deal wisdom is the ability to see and respond to these people or these situations from god's point of view and that's what when we learn the word of christ we get wisdom so what do we do with that wisdom here it is. We teach it and we admonish other people with it. And we do it in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Boy, psalms. Oh, you got to know 91, 139, 1, 10, 37, 25, 27, 36, 35. Uh, 106, uh, 14, 119. You, you need to know the Psalms because they are the things that come with the insight and the calmness of God that if you have learned the word of Christ and let him dwell in your heart with all wisdom, then this is what you use to teach and admonish other. And then it says, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Don't let anybody, don't let anybody, don't let anybody do your music for you. Do your own singing. <laughs> now I do listen a little bit to some music, but I'd rather make my own. God wants you, he wants to put a song in your heart, yours. 
And so, huh, anger has no, I mean, we just, we just, we go through life singing away. And then the scripture says, and whatever you do, that is in word or an action, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Show. Sure. That kind of narrows down what we do, right? How we talk to people, we do it in the name, we do what Jesus would do. And then it says to give thanks to God and the Father by him. These are the first, these are the first steps. The first steps, I took them 26, A to Z, right straight out of the Bible, that if you will do what God says to do, and here's these instructions he gave us, if you will accept personal responsibility for your anger, and do these things, you've just about licked it entirely. Let's give a couple more points before we finish. Number two, stop blaming those who provoke you to anger. Stop. Stop. They are probably going to keep on doing it anyhow. You can't stop them. They're out of control. Stop blaming them for your anger. I meant, remember our first point. Accept personal responsibility for dealing with our own anger. So we can't blame others for it. That's why I'd like you to make sure you see this teaching. Uh, 28 minutes on our website, nothingbutthetruth.org. And it's called How to Respond to the Weaknesses of Others. You're going to have people who will provoke you and aggravate you learning how. What is the biblical way? What is the Jesus way of responding to the weaknesses of others? Stop blaming those who provoke you to anger. Now, before I leave this, though, I, I want to, uh, without a whole lot of detail, take you to the scripture. You know, the one that you know so well. I'm the Lord, I got with a jealous. I'm a jealous God, you know, and I visit the iniquity of the fathers. I visit the iniquity of the fathers, not the mothers. Not the sins. The Bible does not say the sins of the fathers will be visited upon the children. Not the sins. Not the sin. The iniquities. And most people don't even know the difference. That's why <laughs> you ought to make sure you get our book on uh, how to see yourself can deal with the iniquity subject. So whatever a father has that's iniquity, and one of those is anger, it can be visited upon the children as far as three and four generations but watch this now. It's not every, it's not all, all children to third and fourth generation. It's only those who have not learned to love him yet. It's to those that hate him. Wow. And he shows mercy unto thousands of them. Now here's the secret to overcoming iniquity, to love God and keep his commandments. But tragically, Tragically today, angry fathers produce angry sons who produce angry sons. So how do you terminate the anger from your father? Well, you could go to um, Daniel, uh, I believe chapter 9, verse 5. I believe you could go to uh, uh, Nehemiah and learn to confess the iniquities of your fathers as well as your own. Get rid of iniquity. And how do you do that? By loving God and keep his commandments. Make sure. Don't blame others for your anger. Number three. You want to quickly clear your own conscience to prevent what I want to call self-anger. Now, I want you to just pull this. Their conscience bearing witness. Watch now. What is that? The thoughts are either accusing or excusing them. Whew. Living with a, an accusing conscience. Now, a couple of things real quick. Conscience is only infallible as the information fed to it is infallible. 
there are two things. So there's a thing that God calls scripture. It's called the moral law of God that's always put in everybody's hearts. A moral law. They know it. But conscience can be seared. It can be conditioned. And so people who violate moral law over and over again weaken their conscience. The conscience doesn't even bother them anymore. But God wants you to live in a condition where you don't have a conscience that bothers you. So here's one translation that says, JB, for there is something which condemns or commends their actions. We've got this thing going on inside of us, okay? And so what do we do about that? So here we go. So the Apostle Paul said this, I exercise myself. That means, man, I really work at this. To have, look at this, always, not just part-time, but always a conscience void of offense toward God and towards others. Woo! I don't want anything bothering my conscience between me and God. I want to get rid of it. In fact, this is so important that when Paul sent Timothy out, here's what he said. Timothy, I want you to be able to fight a good warfare. Here's how. Two simple weapons. Holding faith and a good conscience. Faith and a good conscience. It takes both. It's not just faith, but good conscience. Which some having put away concerning faith, they made shipwreck. Let's look at Philip's translation of this. Timothy has sent you out to battle for the right. Look at this. Armed only with your faith and a clear conscience. <sighs> a clear conscience. Some alas, have laid these two simple weapons contemptuously aside. And as far as their faith is concerned, they have run their ships on the rocks. A clear conscience. Make sure you clear your conscience. We're hardly sensitive in our culture now. Conscience has been so seared. If you study the New England revivals, in fact, I, I preached, I'm trying to think of the name of the city, I preached in New York 152 years after Charles Finney had been there. You could still could not, 152 years later, you still could not buy a bottle of alcohol in the county. And, and they had revival meetings and the conviction was so great that people couldn't go to work, or when they got to work, they couldn't work very well. So the factory owners sent them to the Finney meetings to get saved so they could come back and do some work. Problem is they didn't get they didn't come back. You know what they did? When they got genuine converted, they did what Zacchaeus, remember that little guy in the Bible? <laughs> Instead of going back to work, they got on their horse and they rode to the next county or wherever, returned things they had stolen. Ask people to forgive them. I, I, God's forgiven me, but I was so wrong. Would you forgive me? They cleared their conscience. Zacchaeus, remember, you sang it. Was a wee little man, wee little man was he, climbed up in the sycamore tree to see what he could see. And as the Savior passed away, he looked up in the tree and he said, Zacchaeus, come on down. <laughs> Go into your house for tea. So he went to Zacchaeus' house. And at the end of the conversation, Zacchaeus said, half my goods I give to feed the poor, and if I've taken anything by false accusation, I restore to that person seven times what I took from them. You see, if you stole a car yesterday and you repent today, what do you do with the car? You take it back. What if you stole it a month ago? Or a year ago? And you may never be able, I mean, you probably most likely can never give equal compensation back because some things just cannot be compensated for. But you do things like this. You go to this person and say, like I did with one of my bosses after I became a Christian. Texaco station owner. I worked for him. Stole floor mats for my car out of his shop. <laughs> this is years later. This is like four years later. 
And I went to him. I said, you know, it's so nice to see you again. And he said the same thing. I said, but the reason I've come to talk to you is because when I worked for you, I did what I should never have done. I've asked God to forgive me, and he has, but I need to ask you to forgive me. I took floor mats out of your shop and never paid for them, and I've come to pay you for them. He didn't know what to say. He muttered a bit, and I said, no, you can't pay. No, 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 no. But now he could be in any meeting I preach in, sit right there, I would have a clear conscience. It took me three years to do that. And I still have to keep on top of it. Make sure you clear your conscience. Then if people arouse you to anger, you want to correct them the right way if you can. Now, they're in big trouble. People who are, well, in fact, let, let the scripture speak for itself. Woe unto the world because of offenses. It, it's, it's neat that offenses, offenses are going to come, but look at this. But woe to that man by whom the if, people who offend are in big trouble with God. Big trouble with God. So what should we do if we love them? From a personal response, we've forgiven them, but they need help. So the scripture tells us this. If a man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore such a one. Help the boy out. In the spirit of meekness, in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Make sure you go. And if your brother trespass again, then go tell him. Tell him his fault. Do it the right way. And if you hear, you've gained your brother. Then lastly, this is really a reiteration of something we've already mentioned. And it is to learn and consistently practice forgiving those who offend us. It cancels. Instead of being angry back, we just, we cancel it. We forgive them. So Peter comes to Jesus and he says, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Do I have to do it seven times in a row? <laughs> Are you ready, Peter? Jesus said unto him, not, not seven times, but 70 times Seven. I know you already did your mathematics and it comes up 390, right? Seven, seven, four, 490. <laughs> ah, without number. How many times do you have to forgive somebody? Over and over and over again. So one of the most important things you can do to destroy anger. The opposite. You see, the devil wants you to be angry. God wants you to forgive. And that's why of all the teachings on our website, nothingbutthetruth.org. You should look this one over. The seven aspects of genuine forgiveness. Easy to say it, a different thing to do it. What are the seven aspects of genuine forgiveness so you know you've really done it? While you're there, you may want to see uh, learning how to love mercy. Whew. And Understand, blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the merciful. For they shall find mercy. And that's what God wants for you, my friend. He doesn't want you to be an angry, out-of-control person. Anger can last a lifetime, damage your health, damage relationships. He wants you to resolve it. These are the biblical steps. The first one was probably the most important of the all. Take personal responsibility for anger. Because if you'll do that, if you will do that, you can learn to live in peace, joy, 
harmony, regardless of your environment and regardless of what everybody around you says or does to you. Never forget this. If God is for you, who can really be against you? Do you ever wonder how to handle that difficult person in your life? David L. Johnston has a free ebook just for you How to Handle Difficult People. Get the free ebook today by going to nothingbutthetruth.org forward slash difficult.